What's going on everybody? Before the video starts, I just want to let all of you know to follow me on Twitch and catch my next stream because I'm going to be streaming three or four times a week all summer. We're going to be reviewing new and old albums and I'm also going to be reacting to viewers music live on stream, helping you guys get critiques and feedback for your work. Come follow me on Twitch at twitch.tv slash volksgoat and don't miss my next stream. The older I get, the more I appreciate Kanye's music. The more I listen to his writing, the more familiar I become with all of his stories, the more I realize he really is the greatest artist alive. To make this many albums and have almost all of them be a masterpiece in their own way is a crazy accomplishment that no one else could replicate. And I think listening to Kanye is therapeutic. His lyrics truly do make me feel less alone. The cathartic themes, the way he portrays the obsessive mind in an artist in such an authentic way, I think it's truly meaningful. So I thought it would be fun to rank all of Kanye's albums worst to best. But I do feel like I've been here before. It's a little unfocused and it's a little light unfocused. It's a little light unfocused light and light, light, light on. Light on anyway, let's rank every Kanye album from worst to best. Number 12, Donda 2. When I said earlier that almost every Kanye album is a masterpiece, Donda 2 would have to be the exception to the rule. Donda 2 is truthfully terrible. There are some good tracks. I think Broken Road is pretty good and True Love is one of the greatest posthumous X songs that ever came out. True love shouldn't be this complicated. Thought I'd die in your arms. I thought I'd die in your arms. But other than that, this album was a plain and clear cash grab. It was full of unfinished songs that had no meaningful direction, themes, or overall style. It's basically a demo album that was thrown together with unfinished verses, reference tracks, and Kanye only did it to sell the stem player. He knows it, we all know it. There's a reason why Donda 2 never came out on streaming. And in my mind, it's kind of a shame that Kanye ever sold this at all. Basically, the only good thing about Donda 2 is that I don't have to see it every time I open Spotify because at least Kanye had the decency or the shame not to upload it to streaming services. While some people say that, yeah, it would have been great if Kanye finished Donda 2, in my opinion, this record is basically an insult to Kanye's artistic legacy and I don't think there was ever anything to finish in the first place. These songs are just some of the worst of the worst in every way, from the unfinished instrumentals to the way that the songs almost singularly focus on Kanye's divorce. It screams cash grab from every angle. I do think the stem player was a cool product. It was admirable that Kanye made all that money in just, what, a week or two, making 10, 20 million dollars in such a short period of time. I personally just don't ever want to hear Donda 2 again. Number 11, Jesus is King. I actually think J.I.K. is really beautiful, and on my personal list, it's pretty much tied with Ye for being almost great, but not quite. The sad thing is, it actually could have been a lot better. Obviously, this album is a butchered version of Yandi, which seems like it would have been a lot more interesting of a project had it ever come out, based on the leaks and demos that you can find floating around YouTube to this day. Yandi was hyped for a long time, and it really did seem like a promising idea. And I personally don't mind Jesus is King. I think it has some beautiful moments without being a great album, but I do understand why some people just don't like this project and they think it represents a lot of lost potential in this era of Kanye's career. I actually think when Donda eventually came along, it was a much better executed version of what Kanye thought Jesus as King would be, and I do respect the themes of faith and family and belief on Jesus as King, but it's just kind of heavy-handed and it's overly reliant on the sound of gospel music, when in reality, Kanye's lyrics just go way too heavy on church cliches instead of really getting into the dynamic nature of faith and salvation in the corrupted heart of man. So on one hand, I do think Jesus is King, despite sounding beautiful, feels a little bit empty and generic, a little bit mid. And while yes, I do think Yandi would have been a better project and that Jesus is King is basically a misguided, undercooked project, it does still have that Kanye factor with beautiful production and uplifting, exciting songs. Tracks like Close on Sunday, Selah, Follow God, Water, God Is, Hands On, they feel just as important as any other Kanye song. Maybe the overarching story isn't that substantial and the religious themes aren't fully fleshed out and the old version of the album would have been better, but in my mind, Jesus is King is still almost a real Kanye experience. 
just not quite. From beautiful samples to great choir performances to uplifting and motivating positive songs, I like Jesus is King a lot, but it doesn't fully speak to me and a lot of other people the same way as the rest of his discography does. Number 10, Yay. Yay, I think, is another album like Jesus is King that's almost great, but just not quite there. I think in a lot of ways, the story behind Yay is a lot more powerful and interesting than the actual album itself. Even though some of my all-time favorite Kanye songs are on this project, it's just not something I really come back to as often as the rest of his work. The story of Ye is centered around Kanye getting diagnosed with bipolar disorder, following a long string of controversy, and it deals a lot with him coming to terms with that. The album is a deep examination of Kanye's mental state at this point in his life, the middle of 2018. A lot of the subject matter on this album shows Kanye kind of trying to accept his flaws, looking at his mistakes, and committing to be a better person while also acknowledging that his mental health is eating him alive and has been for a long time. And that sounds like an amazing recipe for an album. It sounds like something real, personal, serious, a spiritual rebirth of an album where the artist accept his flaws, especially from a larger than life figure like Kanye. And Ye does have some of Kanye's all time greatest tracks from Ghost Town to I Thought About Killing You and Violent Crimes. These songs are uplifting and hauntingly gorgeous while acknowledging the very real dark side of Kanye's mind in a way that we all found relatable. Today I seriously thought about killing you. I contemplated premeditated murder. And I think about There are some tracks I didn't love as much though. And on an album that's only 20 minutes long, a few mid songs is a pretty big overall percentage of mid music. That being said, I think Ye is pretty great, even though I will say it has a bit of a strange feel, considering that after all of the introspection Kanye did on here, he basically ended up going in the opposite direction as a person following this project. All of the writing he did about hurting people, wanting to be better, wanting to forgive and move on, that's all gone like dust in the wind. This album could have been been a turning point, actually. It was a turning point, just not in the direction I think Kanye originally intended. Kanye has always gotten a pass for his controversies, his harshness, his raw outbursts, because he's always been the ultimate hero, the flawed hero who would fall into darkness and rise and fall again. And Ye seemed like it was supposed to begin the next step of Kanye's journey as a changed man, a man with newfound reasons to live and keep on going. But five years later, despite feeling very alive and real and self-aware and introspective, Ye feels instead like a very strange, short chapter in a story that never got finished. And by itself, at least to me, it's not quite strong enough to be considered one of Kanye's best. Number nine, Watch the Throne. Watch the Throne was the first Kanye album I ever listened to back in 2012 when I was 12 years old. I still remember No Church in the Wild being the craziest thing I had ever heard. And looking back, it's crazy that in a lot of ways, this was also Frank Ocean's big break. I remember how happy Otis feels. And I remember the introspection on New Day. Sweet, sweet, sounds so sweet. sweet. Watch the Throne isn't an album that's the best thing either Kanye or Jay-Z ever made, but it still somehow aged really well and didn't get forgotten. It's far from being considered a throwaway collab mixtape. Actually, this album is full of iconic songs that people still love to this day. At the same time though, the second half of Watch the Throne is pretty much full of cheesy throwaway songs that have the five or 10% as many streams as the first half of the project. Primetime, The Joy, Made in America, Who Gonna Stop Me, this isn't anyone's best work, and it's really just not that interesting. That being said, Watch the Throne is definitely still one of the best collaborative projects I've ever heard. No contest. From the luxurious production to the iconic samples, it's just a smart, fresh, clean sounding album. And Kanye and Jay Z obviously just dropped nonstop bragging lyrics about being rich and traveling the world, which wouldn't work if it were anything but these two artists. I'm not listening to Watch the Throne if it were made by anybody else. But Kanye and Jay Z, they have the talent and the persona to weave their success and egotistical attitudes in between humanizing stories about their personal struggles and the themes that are most important to them as people. It makes Watch the Throne far more interesting than just any old collab tape from the early 2010s. Is it mostly just as excessive as it could possibly be? Yes, but these are two artists who can pull that off more than anyone else. And like I said earlier, Watch the Throne has aged way, way, way better than most rap albums from 12 years ago, and I think it will continue to do so. Is it a cinematic masterpiece like the rest of Kanye's work? Definitely not. But is it an extremely polished album when it really didn't even have to be? 
Yes. And that's why we like Kanye in the first place. Just a side note, this is where it gets really hard because honestly, every album after this is one of my favorites ever in some way or another. But I'll try to kind of sort them by how much I listen to them. And ultimately, I want to get to the bottom of which of these masterpieces is my personal favorite. Which one of them means the most to me? Okay, everybody, I'm going to let you know, Kids See Ghosts is not on this list, even though it's a Kanye album. I think it wouldn't be fair to rank it against everything else. Ultimately, I don't think Kids See Ghosts really works on a competitive list next to every other Kanye project. It's not as grand or large, it's not as influential or experimental. It's very interesting, it's very vibrant, emotional, it's very well made. The cohesion between Kanye and Kid Cudi is beautiful, and there are some truly uh, transcendent songs on Kid See Ghosts, but at the same time, it doesn't make sense to rank it next to Yeezus and the Life of Pablo and Dark Twisted Fantasy. It's such a short project, it was made so quickly, Kanye barely takes up uh, less than half the space on the album. I think Kid See Ghosts is a really amazing project, but I don't feel the need to stack it up against Kanye's more involved albums. It just doesn't make sense in my head. I totally respect if Kid See Ghost is your favorite album ever and you really wanted to hear me talk about it, but hopefully you're not gonna be too mad because I'm actually working on a big documentary all about Kid See Ghosts and how they made that album. So hopefully we'll be seeing that in about one or two months. Number eight is Donda. And honestly, I feel sad putting Donda so low because I think Donda is a pretty amazing project. But at the same time, there's so much about this record that could have been a lot better. Ultimately, the overall quality control just wasn't there. And there are a lot of parts of Donda that could have been removed, just thrown away to make a better project. The pacing, the cinematic storyline that makes Kanye's work so great, it just wasn't here. But that being said, I do think Donda is a kind of masterpiece. It's way, way better and a lot more interesting than Ye and Jesus is King. And there are moments on here that make me feel truly emotional. It's full of amazing, beautiful songs like God Breathes, Off the Grid, Hurricane, Jonah, 24, Moon, Heaven and Hell, Pure Souls, Come to Life, No Child Left Behind. That's literally half the album being extremely solid tracks with amazing, beautiful themes but then you take the other half and it's like, eh, whatever. I think overall Donda is full of great ideas, beautiful production, interesting writing, crazy features from half the music industry, but it just doesn't feel entirely finished. From the lack of cover art to the barely finished songs, it doesn't feel like Kanye's heart was totally in it when it comes to making this album well executed and cohesive. Donda is 110 minutes long. It could have been 45, 50 minutes, an hour. It would be hard to say this is one of my favorite Kanye albums because there's so much of this record that I'll never listen to again. That being said, I have to emphasize Donda has great themes in the songwriting. There are extremely beautiful vocal performances, some of the best features I've ever heard from artists like Lil Baby, Lil Durk, Fori, Roddy Rich, The Weeknd. Kanye brought these artists together and brought out the best in all of them. And I love how he was able to get everybody on the same page with their verses feeling so cohesive, like a true group project. Everyone followed these themes of introspection and wholehearted effort maybe everyone except Baby Keem. And I'm not gonna lie, there are some songs on Donda that can make me cry, which in my book counts for a lot when I'm judging how much I like an album. In a way, Donda does contain some of Kanye's most meaningful work, and it does tell an amazing story of love and life and I would love to say that Donda is my all-time favorite Kanye album. It would be so great to say that he came through with the best work of his entire career, 20 years into making music. I'd love to say his 10th album is his absolute best. And in some ways it is, but it's just too long. And I think Kanye should have exercised a lot more control over how this album is presented because all the pieces are there, but there's just too much going on without enough control. There are too many throwaway songs and there just isn't a good reason for this album to be nearly two hours long and it could have been half of that. Donda had so much potential and it only delivered on three quarters of what it could have been. It's a solid eight out of 10 if there ever was one. Though I will say I do love Donda so much, I imagine one day in the future, it could be considered a classic. Lots of Kanye albums were hated or scorned when they first came out only to be loved later. And in my mind, Donda is good enough for the consensus to change later on. After all, this album came out less than two years ago. Number seven, 808s and Heartbreak. 808s and Heartbreak was severely unexpected and different. 
A lot of people liked it, but a lot of people also hated it. But it ended up being one of Kanye's most influential records, making a permanent mark on the musical landscape. It wasn't a rap album. It's a vulnerable, heartbreaking art pop record that finds Kanye in a dark mindset for the first time, after three hit albums full of nothing but wins. 808s has no soul beats, no jewelry, no conscious hip hop lyrics, no profanity, and no rapping whatsoever. Just Kanye and his loss, and heartbreak. After losing his mother and his fiance in the same year, the two people who had been there for him since before he was famous, Kanye had to look deep inside himself to create this record. Almost every song on 808s holds strong to this day as a perfect track. Personally, I don't love Robocop, but every other song still sounds good in 2023. Coldest Winter, Bad News, Streetlights, Heartless, the dark melancholia was unlike anything else in music at the time. I start to fade. On lonely nights, I start to fade. And obviously, we can see that this record shows a major turning point in Kanye's career. To put it simply, Kanye was never the same after the events that inspired this album. He went from the motivating, uplifting hero of rap to the evil anti-hero that everyone loved to hate. I do get why people hated 808s from the start. Today, autotune sounds like nothing out of the ordinary, but 15 years ago, people hated autotune more than anything, and 808s weren't exactly a common sound either. And this is hardly a hip-hop album, I agree, but this style ended up becoming an essential part of the sound of hip-hop, and it still is to this day. At the time, this album was unexpected enough that people were talking about Kanye leaving rap behind altogether and fading away from the mainstream public eye. Basically, people thought this album was gonna make Kanye fall off, which sounds like a crazy thing to say now, but obviously after the huge success of Graduation, it was very confusing that he would walk away from that sound and make something so unmarketable like 808s and Heartbreak from the dark subject matter to the unappealing production. But 15 years later, we can look back and realize that Kanye's risky choices paid off completely with an album that not only opened new doors for him to become even more successful than ever before, but also inspired countless artists to walk in his footsteps and change the sound of music forever. While Kanye may have been inspired by Phil Collins of all people while making 808s and Heartbreak, artists like Drake, The Weeknd, J. Cole, Juice World, Travis Scott, and countless others all owe some of their style to the sound that Kanye innovated on 808s. Even though it may have been Kanye's most hated album when it came out, 808s ended up changing music forever, and that in itself is one of Kanye's greatest contributions to art. He's always been willing to take risks and trust his vision and take the heat from the critics, because of course, that's the cost of inventing new sounds. I think we see so much more of Kanye's soul on this record in a way that's maybe only matched by Yeezus. In my mind, they're actually very similar projects with the raw lyrics, the experimental sounds that people hated until they finally caught up to the genius of what he was trying to do. 808s isn't my most listened to album ever. I'm not really a huge fan of the art pop sound, even though it's a very tight, refined project, but I can definitely recognize what Kanye did for music by making this at all. And that's a monumental achievement. Number five and six, late registration and the college dropout. Young Kanye was just so hungry and so wholesome. There's something so uplifting about hearing how much spirit and heart Kanye put into his music back in the day. And I don't know many other artists, or any really, who ever brought this kind of energy to their early music. But young Kanye, this is a guy who believed he could change the world, and obviously he did. Being released just a year after the college dropout, late registration didn't set out to redefine what made the college dropout a success, but rather it improved subtly on each element of that previous project. The production is more refined, and the songs are still relaxing yet uplifting with wholesome, earnest themes. The differences between late registration and the college dropout are very small, but I do think in general the arrangements and mixing are just a little bit more refined on late registration, but each project has its own fair share of classic songs. The college dropout has family business, school spirit, we don't care, all falls down, spaceship, Jesus walks through the wire. Man, I promise, I'm so self-conscious. That's why you always see me with at least one of my watches. Rollies and poshes that drove me crazy. I can't even pronounce nothing. Pass that for safety. Late registration has Hey Mama, Diamonds from Sierra Leone, Heard Him Say with Adam Levine, Gold Digger, Drive Slow, and Roses. I ain't saying she a gold digger, but she ain't messing with no broke niggas. Now I ain't saying she a gold digger, but she ain't messing with no broke niggas. 
To me, I think the nocturnal, soulful sound of the production on late registration slightly edges out the chipmunk soul on the college dropout, but ultimately both albums paint a very similar picture of who Kanye wanted to be as a new artist on the scene. He was optimistic, ambitious, talented and earnest. And back in the day, Kanye used to get made fun of for being too liberal and too feminine. And you can hear that on here in full force. Kanye wasn't like other rappers at the time. He rapped about the women in his life in a positive way. He spoke out against homophobia. He introduced a new type of fashion with his famous pink polo shirts. In 2005, Kanye said this during an interview with MTV. Hip hop seemed like it was about fighting for your rights in the beginning and speaking your mind and breaking down barriers. But everybody in hip hop discriminates against gay people. He said, to me, that's one of the standards of hip hop. Then he called out his contemporaries and made a call to action, urging them to be more inclusive. He said, me speaking for my entire culture and looking at the rappers out there, hip hoppers discriminate against gay people. I wanna go on TV and tell people you have to stop it. That's discrimination. That's exactly what they used to do to black people. So I'm telling people to stop all of that. And that's the spirit that kind of can be felt all throughout Kanye's first two albums. He was doing his best to be different in a way that was true to him. He was a family man, he cared about people, and the sound of the albums matches that outlook too. The melodies are sweet. They're easy to hum and sing along with. With songs like Heard Him Say, you just get this overwhelming feeling of hope in the face of odds. Kanye attacks wide ranging political and economic issues with a smile on his face. With synth drops, oboe, sweeping strings, comforting drums, vibraphones, it's comforting and familiar while being serious at the same time. And looking back 20 years later, it's not a surprise that Kanye became the prolific, generation-defining artist and designer that he did. His first two records aren't the most experimental projects ever. They're not the most controversial projects ever, but they were still unexpected, and that's exactly what he needed to establish himself in the world of music at the time. I don't think he would have become who he is today if he didn't make these albums. He never would have been famous enough to be Kanye if he didn't make these more familiar, wholesome projects. They are the definition of classic, and while again for me, late registration is slightly more fine-tuned and a little bit more memorable than the college dropout, I think they're still both timeless masterpieces. Number four, My Beautiful Dark Twisted Fantasy. Dark Twisted Fantasy is the best album Kanye ever made. I'm not gonna deny that. From the brilliance of the lyrics to Kanye's full embrace of his status as the villain of the music industry to the gorgeous production, it's one of the most perfect, the most sprawling, the most beautiful albums ever made. I will say though, uh, Dark Twisted Fantasy is not the most influential album Kanye ever made, but that's because it's not the type of record you could ever replicate on any level. It's a landmark. Lost in the World is a masterpiece. Who Will Survive in America is chilling. Runaway is one of the most recognizable songs ever, and it's a solid pick for Kanye's best song. Devil in a New Dress is soothingly cathartic while being edgy at the same time. And I always find, yeah, I always find something wrong. You've been putting up with my shit just way too long. So gifted at finding what I don't like. But ultimately, I think Dark Twisted Fantasy was made more for Kanye's sake than anyone else. It's long, the songs are long, its sounds are beautiful while its themes are dark and ugly. The record contains Kanye's best lyrics, his best production, and he even pushed the features to their absolute maximum limits. Rick Ross, Pusha T, Mike Dean, Nicki Minaj, some of their most iconic work lives inside this one album. And this is the first record that truly shows Kanye as a villain. He had been the hero on graduation. He had been heartbroken on 808s, but on Dark Twisted Fantasy, he reemerged as an evil genius with the sole purpose of disrupting the industry and changing music as much as he could. If Kanye had died in a plane crash right after releasing Graduation, he would be remembered as a great rapper. Not the best ever, but a great rapper. But between 808s and Dark Twisted Fantasy, Kanye underwent a change. The death of his mother, the loss of his fiance, the widespread hatred aimed at him after the Taylor Swift incident, he was never the same after that. Essentially, I think he was overcome with a kind of darkness that inspired him to change the world with his music. He became one of the most prolific, one of the most influential, one of the most experimental artists of our time, all at the same time. But we also watched him slowly get eaten alive by his own mind. The Kanye that was there before was gone. But there was a time when Kanye was spitting up unadulterated genius like it was nothing. He was able to look at his issues and talk about them in a real way before those issues eventually grew so big 
that the sun was blotted out from his artistic spirit. It's very hard to compare Kanye's albums since they all sound so different. For me though, personally, Dark Twisted Fantasy isn't my very favorite. I prefer the sound and lyrics on some of his other projects, but every time I hear Dark Twisted Fantasy for the rest of my life, I'm gonna be simply amazed that any one person was able to pull off a piece of music as cinematic and grand and personal as this. Kanye wasn't the greatest until he did this. But once he did this, he immediately became the greatest. And he still would be the greatest ever if this is all he ever did for the rest of his career. Number three, Graduation. Graduation is an amazing album. I think in many ways it's essentially perfect, but at the same time it leaves behind a very weird legacy. When I was talking about the college dropout and late registration earlier, I mentioned how those albums had themes that were wholesome and uplifting and Kanye was generally basically painting himself as the ultimate underdog. Well, Graduation takes the sound from those albums, it turns it up all the way, and Kanye graduates into being a superstar. Graduation was Kanye's best-selling album yet, it won Rap Album of the Year at the Grammys, and it literally almost went platinum in its first week of sales with three major hit songs. It does sound at first like Graduation would be a kind of conclusion to the trilogy of Kanye's first few albums, but sonically Graduation isn't really at all like the other two. Its style, its themes, its songwriting, it's very different. Kanye got rid of all the interludes that were found throughout the first two records, and the production is a lot more poppy and danceable than the other albums, though I will say I love the production on Graduation a lot. It's hard to describe, but it's very heavy on synths and piano, and songs Songs like I Wonder and Homecoming are just warm and sentimental, while songs like Stronger and Good Life have an insane level of pop appeal and danceability. I met this girl when I was three years old, and what I love most, she had so much soul. She said, excuse me, little homie, I know you don't know me, but my name is Wendy and I like to... And from that point, I never blow her off. This is probably the most accessible Kanye album. Like, literally anyone could enjoy these songs thanks to how friendly the production is. And that's a good thing in my book. The story goes that Kanye felt people didn't understand the complexity of his rhymes and themes on the previous two projects. So he decided to try and convey the same deep meanings with simpler rhyme schemes on graduation. The end product is an album that celebrates Kanye's newfound wealth and fame after two extremely successful albums. Finally, he's a superstar. But ultimately, graduation also can contains themes of self-doubt, there's an ambivalence towards fame, and there's also a melancholic subtext. And many people describe the story of graduation as a sort of existential crisis. To me, it's a lot more relatable than his first two projects. And that's what I love so much about graduation. It's all around a brilliant project. The production is bright and colorful and diverse, and the visual aesthetics are amazing thanks to Takashi Murakami. But I think the way Kanye approached his newfound success makes it a timeless album that a lot of people can relate to. He paints these beautiful pictures of how, despite his incredible success against all odds, he still has this overactive, overthinking mind that focuses a lot on his past, thinking of childhood memories, remembering his mistakes, and holding himself back all too often. That's something everyone struggles with. We all deal with those issues. But it takes someone like Kanye to make his inner monologue into a catchy masterpiece of an album. Graduation made Kanye into a true star, and the persona he created for himself on this record was unlike anything else around at that time. But he he wasn't just any old star. He was a star with meaning behind his ambition. There were deep questions in his lyrics. He was a flawed star that a lot of people could relate to. To me, Graduation is the most essential Kanye album. From the gorgeous, lighthearted production, to the major hits, to the deep cuts, it's comfortable without being simple. Obviously, of course, Kanye's artistic evolution diverged completely from the sound and themes of graduation when his mother tragically died just two months after the album was released. So it ends up feeling like a snapshot of a very short moment in time, a picture of a Kanye that doesn't exist anymore. It's serious, yet lighthearted and optimistic. And I love how Kanye put all of his thoughts on full display, his ambitions and his egos and his flaws and mistakes. It reminds us just how powerful self-confidence and determination can be if you're willing to put in the work. And I think graduation is Kanye at his absolute best. In my mind, it's a perfect masterpiece. Number two, Yeezus. Yeezus is Kanye's second riskiest album after 808s and Heartbreak in terms of sound and presentation. But I also think the narrative around Yeezus is all wrong. In some ways, Kanye was in his villain arc at this time, but in my mind, Yeezus is a pretty vulnerable and conflicted project, despite being so harsh and abrasive and devilish at first glance. At least personally, that's my favorite part of this project. I also have to mention the production. Even though this was a relatively short album, it ended 
ended up being hugely influential for years on down the line. Travis Scott, the entire SoundCloud scene, uh, Opium, Tyler the Creator, even Kendrick Lamar. The dark distortion of Yeezus can still be heard echoing throughout the music industry many years later. But people hated Yeezus at first. Obviously, it's abrasive, chaotic, distorted. It was a huge switch up from Kanye's previous work. It sounded like nothing else in the rap game at the time besides maybe Death Grips. The harsh industrial sound was so unexpected after the orchestral grand dark twisted fantasy. And not only did Yeezus sound different, Kanye also faced a lot of backlash for his words at the time. Songs and statements like, I am a god. He really started to push the boundaries of what an artist was allowed to say in public. So yeah, I really think Yeezus is a turning point for Kanye where he's like, look, I just redeemed myself after the Taylor Swift incident with a masterpiece of Dark Twisted Fantasy, but clearly that level of controversy permanently changed Kanye's outlook in a lot of ways. It seems like he no longer cared about redemption at all, and he was instead content to fall even further into the villain mindset with dramatic, angry songs driven by harsh synths, explosive samples, booming drums, and the most rushed, fevered, intense vocals of any Kanye project. The lyrics on Yeezus aren't better than a lot of other Kanye albums. In fact, a lot of people hate them because they're simple and shallow and very vulgar. But I personally love a lot of his songwriting here. A lot of Yeezus lyrics are incredibly memorable with one-liners, personal autobiographical stories, and it just feels very unfiltered. Kanye's delivery though makes it work. He just sounds so strained and intense throughout the entire project. The whole album feels like a bad dream. There's an unconventional lack of snares, the noise, the industrial sounds, the samples, the feedback, the chaos, the stories about late nights, arguments, internal battles, the anger on Hold My Liquor, the paranoia on I Am A God, the arrogance on On Sight. Bitch, I'm back out my coma, waking up on your sofa, when I park my Range Rover, slightly scratch your Corolla, okay I smash your Corolla, I'm hanging. Jesus' themes are dark and clear and they work really well. This album is a cohesive masterpiece. But Yeezus isn't a minimal album, even though it is experimental and rather short. It features a wide variety of influential producers, from Arca to Bon Iver to Travis Scott, Lupe Fiasco, Gesaffelstein, and even Daft Punk. Justin Vernon and Chief Keef's vocals on Hold My Liquor ended up being two of my favorite features of any Kanye song ever, and Frank Ocean's singing at the end of New Slaves is just perfect. Ultimately, looking back, Yeezus definitely needed time to cook. It was a huge left turn, just completely unexpected after Dark Twisted Fantasy, and at first it looked like a risk that may not pay off. There was so much backlash, but ultimately Yeezus paid off. It became one of the most influential albums of the last 20 years. It was yet another game-changing masterpiece by Kanye West. And the evolution he went through over the years is totally clear. The insane feedback, the angelic interludes that get interrupted by speaker-shaking bass, any reference to the pink polo, the bear suit, that that version of Kanye was dead and gone. And to me, the tortured, conflicted battle between ego and anger and perfection, the pain, that's the best part of Yeezus. It's easily Kanye's most cathartic project by far. It provides a certain type of comfort. When I feel crazed by my ambitions, when I feel frustrated by people around me, Yeezus is a reminder that beauty can be harsh in real life and in art. And in that way, it's a very comforting project for a certain type of mood. Ultimately, Yeezus is a one-of-a-kind project that depicts the intensity of the artist's mind with a sound that matches the manic level of feeling and emotion. Ultimately, I think Yeezus is probably Kanye's most cohesive most risky, most impactful, raw album. It's one of the best ideas he ever had. And while the cost for that was immediate backlash, the long-term impact of this record shows its true brilliance. Number one, The Life of Pablo. The Life of Pablo is pretty much the last of Kanye's legendary albums, and this record was an all-out event. This was an era. This is what Donda was meant to be, but obviously Kanye was in a much better frame of mind to actually pull it off. But still, you can hear that this was the beginning of the end for Kanye actually focusing enough to make an album feel cinematic and well-crafted. The Life of Pablo has so many songs, and they're all great, but the way that they're arranged is jarring to say the least. It's a mess but it's a beautiful mess for sure. My favorite songs on the life of Pablo are probably the ones that come after the I Love Kanye interlude. FML, Real Friends, Wolves, 30 Hours, No More Parties in LA, Saint Pablo. These are just my all time favorite Kanye songs. And Kanye's attitude on here is that he was just one of the best to ever do it. At this point, he had created so many classic albums. He had become successful with fashion. He had made a family. This record addresses just nearly every thought he could possibly ever have from his greatest success to his darkest 
struggle and its undisputed masterpiece. Truthfully, the life of Pablo is Kanye's last masterpiece, either for now or possibly forever, and I think that's okay. It's a wide-ranging, broad piece of music that addresses so many different subjects. I think in a lot of ways it feels like every Kanye album summed up into one. From the funny, goofy moments like I Love Kanye, to the wholesome religious intro Ultralight Beam, to the trap bangers Father Lift My Hands, to the personal autobiographical songs 30 Hours, No More Parties in LA. When you're on the Ultralight Beam, this is a God dream, this is a God dream, this is everything. Pablo feels like a palette of every mood Kanye's ever had all at the same time. It's not his tightest project. It's not Yeezus or 808s. It's not his most cinematic project. This isn't Dark Twisted Fantasy. The Life of Pablo is a bipolar feeling album, but that's not a bad thing. That's how Kanye felt at the time. All of his greatness and all of his flaws, one after the other, at a time when he was at the peak of his relevance, with a massive international tour, the mind-blowing success of his shoe line, the popularity of his music, all coming to a head at the same time. He didn't need this to be a cohesive, musically consistent album for it to be great. There are so many different sounds, and yeah, not everyone loves every song from the life of Pablo, but it's the most human album Kanye ever made. When I want to listen to Kanye, I'm listening to the life of Pablo 40 or 50% of the time. Kanye really portrays his struggles while also celebrating what he's capable of. When I feel overwhelmed by work, when I feel pressure to succeed, when I feel like I can't do things right, or I feel overly obsessed with my goals, the life of Pablo is the album for me almost every single time. It's comforting to hear that Kanye was still concerned with being better, and he was still struggling with keeping up with his personal responsibilities even when he had made it this far. Even when he was trying to engage better with his family and God, he was still thinking about women and money. But it is what it is. This is his best. With chilling moments like Real Friends and Wolves and funny yet personal tracks like No More Parties in LA to the amazing storytelling on 30 Hours and St. Pablo, there's a song for every single mood. It may be a little bit all over the place, but the way Kanye put his deepest thoughts into the record and spread it all throughout these sounds and ideas is nothing short of a masterpiece. The Life of Pablo is a picture of a living, breathing, cultural icon experiencing deep internal struggle at the same time he has the entire world at his fingertips. It makes the album a powerful work of genius in every way. From the zeitgeisty yet beautiful production to the autobiographical lyrics, The Life of Pablo is the essential Kanye album. It's a collage of everything he ever made all at once, if there ever could be one. And it's my personal favorite project he ever made. Like I said at the beginning of the video, I've only come to appreciate Kanye's music more as I get older. I feel like I'm learning more about what life really is and what it means to try and succeed and fail and to work hard. And I think all throughout his discography, you can feel the urgency that Kanye experiences, trying to make an impact, trying to leave a legacy, trying to be a true artist. It almost feels like a type of mania. And in that way, he's one of the ultimate artists with an amazing discography because he never lets up. I do think the way he makes albums changed after Yeezus, everything after the life of pop Pablo feels less like a premeditated idea with a theme and a concept and more like a collection of songs written during that year. And some people may not like that, but to me it does add to the authenticity. At the end of the day, each and every one of Kanye's albums is different, they're all their own kind of masterpiece, and when you look at all of them together, you get one of the greatest discographies of all time. Kanye put his entire soul into his music, the good, the bad, from beginning to end, and everything in between. Is Kanye's music all perfect? No, definitely not. But is he the most unique and authentic artist of our generation? Definitely. He's the artist of our generation. And that's what matters more than anything. I'm Philip. This is Volksgeist. Check out my Discord. Check out my Twitch. Follow me on Instagram. And thank you so much for watching. Like I mentioned earlier, I think the most important part in being a successful, skilled creator or artist is building real tangible skills that you can use to get more work or work on more new types of projects. And that's why Skillshare is one of the only sponsors that I'm willing to work with for Volksgeist. Because sponsors are great, but to me the most important thing is that I can offer real value to my audience. And Skillshare is a service that I've been using regularly for years. Thanks to Skillshare, I've learned so much about graphic design, photography, video production, animations. As a self-taught person, as someone who created his career from scratch, Skillshare has paid for itself 
20 times over. So if you're at all like me, if you're someone who wants to direct their own career, and if you want to feel fulfilled and creative at the same time, I think Skillshare could be a great resource for you. Because one of the greatest things about Skillshare is that they also have hundreds of career-focused classes with the goal of not just teaching you how to do something, but how to apply it to larger life goals like financial stability, new career options, and they even have classes about being a freelancer, being your own boss, which is something that I'm very grateful I had access to over the years. In my mind, these are all important things for anyone who wants to be a capable creator who can use their talents to make money or reach new levels of creative output. But even more importantly than that, I have my own Skillshare class where I share all of my most used techniques for making the animations that make Volksgeist possible. In my class, I give a full beginning to end breakdown of my methods, how I use After Effects, how I use Premiere. But of course, that's just one of thousands of different Skillshare classes that can teach you all sorts of new creative skills and lessons in every area from animation to video editing to photography to music production and so much more. I think Skillshare is one of the best ways for people who want to control their own learning to get great, meaningful lessons from experts. And best of all, they're offering two interesting deals just this month only because Skillshare is offering one month free to anyone who uses the link down below or you can get 40% off a one year membership. So just for you guys, there are two links down below, two options for whatever sounds better to you, either one month for free or a year for 40% off. So check out the two links down below, support my channel, check out the Volksgeist class and dive into the thousands of great lessons that are available on Skillshare. Thank you so much and I'll see you again very soon.